We were flown in by helicopter to the top of the ridge and we did uh, line construction for over an hour or so. Made it down, we tied it in. And then right here is where we're gonna tie in and anchor it and then get to work and start working down the hill because we saw crews and engine companies from the bottom working themselves up. So we figured we can tie in with them in no time because it's gonna be easier working downhill. We'll catch them before they come uphill. So it was gonna be an easy deal and then just widen it out and prove our line and we'll be out of here. Welcome, we're here today with two members of Crew 22 to talk about the Glen Allen fire that happened 25 years ago. During the Glen Allen fire, we lost two of our firefighters and two others were severely burned. And anyone that was on the fire that day is gonna carry that with them the rest of their lives. We have Roy Rodriguez who was on the crew and Gabe Larios. The reason we're talking about the Glen Allen today is we're also as a department introducing the incident within the incident. And the Glen Allen fire was certainly the foundation for that. The fire was located in Altadena, an area protected by the Los Angeles County Fire Department and adjacent to the Angeles National Forest. This is an initial action zone for both agencies. The temperature was in the mid 80s. The relative humidity was 35 to 40 percent with southwest winds estimated at 5 to 10 miles per hour. The weather remained constant throughout the afternoon. Los Angeles County and the Angeles National Forest both sent a first alarm brush dispatch that consisted of 10 engines, one Forest Service hotshot crew, one bulldozer, four Los Angeles County inmate hand crews, and a Los Angeles County Helitac module. The Helitac module consisted of Helicopter 15 and a nine-person fly crew with the call number of Crew 22. Each agency also dispatched battalion chiefs and support personnel. This was a total of approximately 165 firefighters. Los Angeles County was working two other wildland fires at the time and the Forest Service was assisting on one of these fires. These two fires involved one Angeles National Forest helicopter and four Los Angeles County helicopters. As a result, both agencies were short of helitac crews when the Glen Allen fire was reported. With all Los Angeles County fly crew supervisors committed to other fires, a crew supervisor without fly crew experience was pressed into service with a backup fly crew for the Glen Allen dispatch. This crew supervisor had 14 years of fire experience, with three of those years as a supervisor of inmate hand crews. The backup fly crew was Ground Crew 2-2. They had been recalled from a work project to go into service as a fly crew. Crew 2-2 consisted of six firefighters, two crew leaders with 13 and 23 years of fire experience, and the temporarily assigned crew supervisor. As ground crew 2-2 pulled into the station, they were dispatched to the Glen Allen fire. In their haste to load in Helicopter 15, they forgot their second crew radio. Helicopter 15 with crew 2-2 arrived over the fire at 1528 and circled the fire twice. The crew supervisor, the crew leaders, and the pilot discussed their options. In their size up, they observed that the fire had made an initial run up a bowl and had crested a ridge with fire burning on each side of the ridge. This ridge is the east side of a large drainage containing many small dissecting chimneys. Flame lengths were a maximum of two to three feet and the crew viewed this as no big deal, a quick in and out assignment. They decided to land above the fire on an open knob and proceed down the ridge and with the assistance of Helicopter 15, attack the head of the fire. You're now looking down that ridge. The crew offloaded at 1533 and put the plan into action, attacking the head of the fire with four crew members working the fire edge on each side of the ridge. The group working the fire edge on the east side of the ridge quickly knocked down the fire and put in a scratch line downhill about 75 feet. Within 10 minutes, the crew supervisor regrouped the crew 
and directed the entire crew to work the fire edge downhill along the west side of the ridge. Helicopter 15 began making water drops on the west side of the ridge in front of the crew as they built handline downhill toward the Altadena Crest horse trail. The horse trail is highlighted along the center of the screen. You're now looking directly across the large drainage at the horse trail. By 1600, crew 22 tied their hand line into the trail. This trail had stopped the uphill fire spread for approximately 75 feet to the west of their tie-in point. Crew 22 walked the trail west to where the fire edge dropped below the trail into the bottom of the drainage. They took a short two or three minute break at this location. So what I remember is um, we took a small break, maybe five minutes, up on the Altadena Horse Trail, um, which is going to be just about 100 feet above or so from where the burnover occurs. We, we talked about a plan, and the plan was basically just to continue the line that we were already putting in. One of the things that I do remember about it, it was very easy uh, line to put in. We are in that decomposed granite there on the front country, and uh, that's really nice when you're swinging a tool. Um, it didn't factor in. This is the beginning of my second season, um, fire season with the camp. So it didn't factor into me that, that had the need for egress, that that was going to hamper it. I just realized that it was nice to swing a tool on. So, um, so we stopped. We took the break. Um, the saw team went down below me. I was the first uh, tool, swinging tool. Um, they're punching some line in. They, they get to about, um, you know, maybe about 30 feet in. And uh, I'm just scraping, putting in 18 inches of uh, line there. Um, we had just asked for a water drop previous to that, so the fire had really knocked down. Again, we had a small little backing fire, nothing that, that you would even be concerned with at all. It, at this point, the thing in my brain, you know, being so limited was when are we going to get out of here and what's going on with the other fires, you know, because this fire is out for all intents and purposes. So yeah, we're punching in line, uh, we're dropping down in, and um, we get probably about maybe three minutes worth of work in, and we're um, some scratching some line. And it's the first time I heard... Uh, a voice of concern from the top it's hey you guys have fire on the other side of the ridge there so I remember taking a look over I don't see anything down below us um, I don't really see anything that, that's gonna alarm me so I'm like okay what is what does that mean you know um, so I continue to go to work actually so I, I like okay we got fire on the other side somebody identified something uh, about six or se seven seconds later I hear hey you guys need to get out of there there's fire on the other side so I turn, I look on the, on, now I can see the slope start to go up on the other side. And it's going up, it looks like it's probably about five acres, but it's, it's putting out some pretty good heat, um, pretty good flame on the other side. So um, I turn and I'm like, okay, I got a direction now, and the direction's, you know, you need to get out. So um, I turn and I start to walk out. And uh, about six or seven seconds later after that, I hear, um, hey, you guys need to get out of there with a lot more urgency um, you guys got fire below you so that was the first time where i realized that hey this thing is now underneath us and it's coming and it's it's going to impact us if we don't get out of here so i remember turning back and trying to find the saw team i climb over the top of a little spur ridge and i look down and i see the saw team below me and i remember seeing chris herman who's got the saw in his hand i don't remember seeing chris barth at this time but chris herman shows me the saw and i remember saying like hey drop the saw let's get out of here so the second he drops the saw and he starts to make his way back out, I climb back up that little spur ridge and it seems like about three, four, five seconds later the fire's on us. So in between that time I had heard that large roar that they talk about, that freight train, that all that energy is coming up from the bottom and it's making a pretty good push on us. I get about four or five seconds in from that when I, when I see Chris Herman down the bottom and um, what I realized at this point is that my feet are scrambling in the decomposed granite. I got no footing. I can't get out the line that we just scratched in. And I can see the horse trail that's only, you know, maybe 30 feet above us. So, I mean, the horse trail is right there, but I can't make any headway. So what I decide is I'm going to go up into the black, and I get about four or five steps up into the black, and that's when um, the fire impacts us. So all that loud noise, all that energy that's coming up, I remember when it actually hits, that everything gets quiet for a second. So I think I, you know, the energy is upon us now. And um, I remember opening my eyes at one point and seeing nothing but orange all around me. And uh, you know, I realized at that point that, that the fire's on us and that it's, it's doing what it's doing. This was given to me about, maybe about a year and a half ago, somebody came across this in one of the training um, bunkers and they were, uh, it was part of the investigation, so it was taken from me. So about a year and a half ago, um, 
I used to always tell the Glen Allen story to try to match it up with what I saw and then kind of what I experienced. And uh, getting a hold of my gear, I was actually pretty excited to see like how you know burned it was. And and um, so the first thing I got to was my brush coat, and I took it out and I was looking at it, and you could see very little browning on it. Um, not a whole lot of areas where it actually was impacted by direct flame for a, a great duration. Um, I look, took a look at my pants and the web gear. The web gear had a lot of plastic on it and that was pretty melted. And then um, I got to my helmet and the helmet actually had some pretty good melting to it. So, I mean, if you think about just in terms of how you're standing on a hillside and how heat rises, um, it's one of the, the things I use to teach the recruits now is about just stay low if you can. If um, your shelter is not accessible or you didn't have time to grab your shelter, whatever happened, you can get down low, protect your airway. But, I mean, this is a pretty good, I stayed on fours for the entire time. So you get a pretty good idea of how hot it was up top and then what was going on a little bit lower. Um, I did receive burns to 43% of my body and if you look at the picture that, that the Nomex paints probably some radiant heat and some convect, convected heat and um, a little bit of direct flame. So it kind of changed and shifted my story a little bit to what I saw and what I experienced and, and it, it paints a little bit better picture out here. When I uh, eventually came out I was down by where the cross is and we noticed a spot fire behind me on the other side of the canyon and it took from just that time to make it up to here before fire was all the way running to the left of me the entire bowl was going and involved in fire so like i said before probably less than 40 seconds uh, from the time we noticed a spot fire to the time that we're being impacted by fire so I made my way up to here and coming up, trying to get my shelter out, make it to the top here, start pulling out my shelter, heat, smoke, everything's impacting me at this time, trying to make it, trying to follow the guys that are already ahead of me. And as I'm coming out, they disappear into the smoke. I start feeling the heat wave, get my shelter all out, realize I can't go any further this isn't a good thing. Get into my shelter or partial deployment and then come over into this cut bank here, which has already been burned out. Deploy my shelter down here, partial, get impacted by fire. Can hear my crew below me getting impacted by fire, knowing something's not right. Stay here for about a minute or so. Once I get out of my shelter, people start coming out of the smoke and this is where we do an accountability uh, report here figure out who's missing um, and what we need to do um, as far as getting help up to our location and get back over to the side and try to help out and find my buddies did a head count and noticed that we had four of us that were unaccounted for on the crew so basically trying to put a plan together of what we are going to do well first we had to find them because you couldn't see where the, uh, the victims were at. So kind of myself and Steve Cooch, it got together and kind of went down over the side of the hill to figure out what we could do, gathered up some waters with us. And we came across uh, Art Ruesca and uh, we could see that he uh, was critical and we wanted to get him out as soon as we could. And and I know we needed help. I didn't have a radio at this time. And that's about the same time that I looked over and saw Gabe and went over <laughs> to Gabe to do what I could with Gabe and stuck with him for a while. And um, once I assisted him back up to the top of the hill to the trail, um, I could still see that I needed help. And at that time I'd grabbed the radio and try to get assistance up there As he was coming back from uh, 82 Alpha, he had uh, a load of water. He was coming back to assist us. And this all happened while he was going to get us uh, some water. And he heard the conversation and he finally got on the radio and said, I know where they're at and said, have everybody direct all uh, contact through the helicopter and the IC. And he was gonna take charge of basically being the incident commander or the liaison between us and Incident Command at that point. After um, assisted Gabe up to the hill, I met with another crew, told them that uh, take care of Gabe, 
Um, I need help down below with Art Ruesca and I still have two more missing. So basically went down with some, gathered up some more waters because I knew these guys were um, uh, gonna need anything that I could give them at that point. Uh, went back down to Art Ruesca and talked to Steve kind of about a plan of how we're gonna try to get him out of here as soon as we get help. And then notice uh, Chris Barth down in the uh, bottom of a uh, spur ridge, uh, disoriented and decided to go down and assist him however I could. Stayed with him probably for 45 minutes until another crew showed up and um, just trying, you know, trying to do whatever I could for him. And, and then once he was stabilized there on the, the ridge, came back up and went around to the other side to see if I could find Chris Herman. And, uh, and I couldn't see where he was at because he was actually uh, lower down into the canyon and that was a whole nother incident that I wasn't part of uh, that day and then just basically by the time I got back up and helped load him on the helicopter was taken off the incident after that and, um, not sure what what else went on as far as the rescue procedures after that ended up in a leadership position by accident basically because I knew what I needed. I knew I needed help. Uh, we were having problems with the radios. I had an unfamiliar foreman with me. He's usually used to working with the ground crews. And I mean, you've got to uh, think to yourself too, that you can't always rely on your supervisor or um, other crew members also, because the ones who are in charge they may be the victim at this point and you may need to take over at that point to start making stuff happen. So the, um, I feel everyone on the crew should know how, who they're working for, how to get a hold of somebody and how to request and, and get help when you need it. We needed one, one person at the top to direct this entire incident and so we could actually get to work on treating the victims and getting these guys off the hill. And when you think about it, it took over an hour and, and you could throw a rock at houses. We were that close to the street and still it took an hour to get everybody, uh, or start getting people start off the hill. Off, that yeah. wasn't even the end of it. So right. if we reflect back on <clears throat> where we're trying to go today with the incident within an incident, it's to capitalize, I mean, 25 years ago, it's to capitalize on what happened to you that, at that on that day. Mm -hmm. And since then, we have, uh, not only are we in, starting the incident within an incident program, but we have rope rescue, we have over the side training. Uh, we've, we've tr actually trained on it for several years about how to evacuate people, hoist rescue. Although on that day, I don't know that hoist rescue would have worked because the train was so steep. But yes. again, we've learned a lot about the actual tactics to carry this out where in, the, in those days it, they were just making it up on the fly there was no specialized equipment there was a few stokes baskets around the county but that was it there mm -hmm. nothing else was available so you know our hope is obviously that with the incident within an incident program or as you pointed out there's a fixed leader up there and it was an organizational problem nobody was really in charge of it it was all good people trying to do good things but nobody was actually in charge of it looking at the big picture and making sure that certain steps were being taken. Today, we have a lot of resources. In fact, our fire department, we have the best of everything, but it still comes down to a good organization that can support the needs of that incident in the moment. Because every incident's gonna be different. Hopefully, we're never gonna have another Glen Allen, but there'll be, there will be other incidents. Mm -hmm. And uh, so again, it's about a good organization with good equipment, well-trained people. That's what it comes down to. Well, speaking on an incident, um they had asked me when I finally got a hold of somebody at dispatch was, what incident are you on? Now I'm looking over the side of the hill. I said, I have no idea. So I think I'm in Altadena. So it, it's probably a good thing to know where you're at, whether now we have all the technology with GPS, you can mark your spot, write it down later. You can call in you know, to the copters. Uh, this is my exact position. Whereas I'm trying to look at trees and hills and and streets and have no idea where I'm at you know I'm I'm on the third fire <laughs> I think it's Eaton Canyon so and I'm yeah. just throwing it out there that you, you need people need to know where you're at I think uh, what we need to think about as an organization as a department is that 
what's the difference between a structure fire uh, emergency and a wildland fire emergency is that the wildland fire emergency is most likely going to be very complex because of terrain, access, and so forth. Now, you could have the same thing on a high-rise fire. Or a firefighter gets injured up on a roof. It's hard to get him off. Uh, whatever the, the situation is, it still comes down to having that good organization. It still comes down to somebody stopping what they're doing, being put in charge, clearing the frequency, and begin to build an organization that will support whatever needs to happen with, with the firefighter. Our firefighters are very capable, well-trained, and uh, we understand rope rescue and hoist rescue and so forth, but it still comes down to somebody taking ownership of that and being in charge of it and directing it. And in wildland, certainly, it's just more complicated because it's remote and it's steep and uh, hard to get to. So there's a number of things to be thinking about out here as I listen to their story. <clears throat> and uh, that is, there's some, uh, much has changed like we talked about earlier, much has changed. We have more radios on the crew, we have better communications, and all the lessons that we put out about the importance of how to utilize the fire orders to help you make good decisions uh, come from this fire. So it's really important that you take those seriously. Some uniqueness about this part of the fire was that they were cut in line downhill, which we know is always a dangerous uh, predicament, and they had underslung lines. So in other words, they had underburned fuel below their position. And at 4 in the 4.30 in the afternoon when this flare-up occurred, the slope is what we would call in perfect alignment. So the onshore breeze is coming in and developing. Uh, the hill is very, very steep, over 100% uh, slope. Had a lot of uh, flashy and heavy fuels in it. And so they get a fire igniting below them and they don't know about it. Second fire order, know what the fire is doing at all times. They were unaware of it. And the fire comes up below them where they can't see it coming. And what makes this slope especially difficult is that we know that as fire travels uphill on a slope that's say 40% or less, the fire sort of stands up and moves up in the front. But when the slope is steep like this one, the fire tends to lay down on the slope. And so what happens is not only is the flame coming up to get you, but all that convective energy is preceding it. So these guys were, were impacted immediately by the convective heat. They couldn't see the fire yet, but that convective heat hit them and was causing life-threatening injuries and fatal injuries uh, in a very short period of time. Then, of course, when the flames hit, it even exacerbates the problem. Remember, there's, there's, we, have, we operate in two phases nowadays. One is the risk management process where we come out and we plan what we're going to do. We, we look at the problem, we make sure we're on the right frequency, we know who we're reporting to. All those are really important ingredients to everything these guys talked about and experienced that day that they didn't have. So as we use the risk management to make our plan, once we decide we're going to make the plan and they decide to go down the hill, this is when we begin to apply the fire orders. And the fire orders are really important to help guide us to make the right choices. So a fire order in this case is uh, uh, fire order number two, know what the fire is doing at all times. So that prompts you to think about, well, what is the fire doing? And we look down here, we can't see it. So there's a fire order that says, post a lookout when there's possible danger. So that means get somebody with a radio and go out to the point where they can look below and communicate with you and warn you. All those things matter. Every step of that matters. Every piece of that fire order, I think, applied to what these guys went through that day. So again, the fire orders are for a purpose. They're to help guide you to make good choices on the fire line when you're actively engaged in fighting the fire. When we prepare ourselves for any kind of emergency, whether it's a structure fire or a wildland fire, we have processes now that we didn't have in the past. And, and you have to train on those. During the fire isn't the time that you break the book out and start looking at the instructions. You need to have it embedded. It's like a computer. You load your computer with all that information of how to operate out here safely. Incident within an incident is the same thing. <clears throat> you can't wait till it happens to you to figure out, oh, gee, what was that training about? It has to be intuitive so that you know how to react instinctively. Because for these guys, think about these guys out here for uh, over an hour with severe burns. Go burn your finger, your pinky on the stove tonight and think about uh, that pain as compared to what these guys were going through for over an hour and some time, almost an hour and a half for the second uh, person to get off here. That's terrible pain to inflict on people. So the better we are at our incident within an incident, the better we can take care of our own people. It's very important.